Hello, hello there, and welcome back to War Thunder. Today you will see the review on the Type 143. As promised in my intro, this is now the actual beginning of proper ship reviews, and they will be a bit different from my tank reviews. So, before I begin to talk myself about the ship and what it can do in War Thunder, its specific weapon systems, the strengths and weaknesses, how to play it, how to fight against it, I think I will have an expert on the history of the ship and I actually received now um, a yeah, 5 minute guide from Drakinifel. For those of you who don't know who Drakinifel is, he has his own YouTube channel and he is very much into ships from the ironclad era, the age of sail to the dreadnought, super dreadnought era, world war one, interwar period, world war two and everything um, since then to the modern days, he knows everything about it. So he will give you a brief overlook over the ship. I hope you enjoy. The Type 143 Albatross class is a direct descendant of the Schnellboote or S-boats, or E-boats as they were helpfully known by the Allies, of World War II. In the post-war environment, some surviving S-boats stayed in service with the West German Navy until they were gradually replaced in the late 1950s by the Type 140 Jaguar class fast attack craft. These craft were still very much torpedo boats with some ability to lay mines and a basic defensive gun armament. These were supplemented by the Type 141 Seer Adler class, which were basically the same, only with more powerful engines. The Type 140s would eventually be replaced in service by the Type 148 Tiger class, while the Type 141s would be replaced by the slightly more powerful Type 143s, which are the main subject we're looking at today. Fast attack craft had entered a bit of a lull after the Second World War, as rapid-firing 6-inch guns with radar guidance appeared to make them obsolete. A cruiser equipped with such weapons, or even the latest destroyers, could reasonably expect to blast apart any number of attack craft whose longest range weapons were torpedoes, long before they got in range, with the exception of congested coastal and island areas. However, the Soviets had built the Komar class in the 1950s, introducing heavy anti-shipping missiles to the equation, and these had proven quite successful in early operations in Egyptian hands against the Israeli Navy. And these were followed by the OSA class, mounting twice the missile firepower, along with three separate subclasses of Project 206, which retained an emphasis on torpedo armament for the most part. Given that West Germany was on the front line of the Cold War, and operations in the North Sea and Baltic Sea could be expected, the Type 143 was designed in part as a countermeasure. To keep weight down, the hulls were composite as opposed to steel, and four diesel engines gave a total of just under 18,000 horsepower, which would send them through the water at a fairly rapid 40 knots max speed. Unlike many similar fast attack craft of the time, however, their offensive firepower did not rely solely on their missiles, which consisted of two paired launchers for a total of four French-made MM38 Exocet missiles. These were slightly faster and longer range than the American Harpoon or the Norwegian Penguin missiles, whilst having a slightly smaller warhead than the American weapon. But where many other fast attack craft had guns in the 30 to 40 mm range, which were primarily defensive and for use against other small craft, the Type 143s carried a pair of single 76 mm rapid fire guns for anti ship and anti air work. Although smaller than the 4.5 and 5 inch guns found on frigates and destroyers, the 76mm is more commonly found on corvettes, so this represented a significant armament for a small fast attack craft. This would give the ships a superiority in firepower once the initial missile exchange was over in a battle of fast attack craft, and also stood a reasonable chance of shooting down incoming missiles of the time in conjunction with the ship's decoy and chaff launchers, whilst also retaining a degree of lethality against larger surface ships that it might encounter. A total of 10 ships would be ordered, each one named, in German of course, after a bird of prey. The class would be split into two groups of five, operating from the Warnemunde naval base under the designations of Schnellbootgeschwerder 2 und 7. Partially in response to the significant firepower these ships represented, the next generation of Soviet attack craft would be the Tarantel class corvettes, which, as the name suggests, were significantly larger and carried a lot more firepower. 
Additionally, a number of existing classes were given either single or paired 57mm guns in retrofit instead of the 30mm that was more common on Soviet craft previously. An added sting in the tail came in the shape of a pair of rear-launching torpedo tubes for wire-guided torpedoes. Although with the violent and fast manoeuvring likely in a pitched battle between fast attack craft, it was unlikely that control would be kept long enough to get them into passive acquisition range, and as a result they were basically never used, even in exercises. The ships were in service for almost 30 years, transitioning over to the new German Navy after reunification, and being finally decommissioned in 2005, being replaced by the Gepard class, which had previously supplemented them. Condor and Falca being decommissioned earlier and presumably are either in reserve or have been scrapped, whilst Gier, Sperber, Greif, Seeadler, Habicht and Cormoran were sold to Tunisia immediately after decommissioning, and Albatross and Bussard being sold to Ghana in 2010. You can also buy a model kit of the class, which is made by Revel. In War Thunder, the Type 143 Albatross is a battle rating 4.0 rank 2 end of the line tech tree ship and it is designated as a fast attack craft. Its main armament consists of two 76mm automatic guns with 80 round clips. You have four of them per gun, giving it an overall ammunition capacity of 640 rounds. Furthermore, we have two torpedo tubes in the back where the torpedoes actually launch to the rear and then they turn around and go towards the target. Furthermore, the missile launchers are inactive, you cannot use them at the moment in War Thunder. The ship has no armor whatsoever, even the massive gun turrets are unarmored, meaning that with even HE or AP shells you can disable the frontal and rear facing firepower. In the X-ray you can see that from this 400 ton ship the ammo racks are exactly below the turrets, there are big targets and they are above the waterline easy to hit, so in theory you can one shot the ship with ease. The ship overall is quick with 76 km per hour forwards and nearly 30-40 km per hour backwards. And then we can see that in the middle there is not a lot of modules to be hit with armor piercing. The ship is rather fragile but it's fast and the automatic 76mm guns can deal with these, even with small destroyers. Now let's talk about the ammunition and the stock HE shell is the 76mm DM251 high explosive shell. A great master velocity of 940 meters per second allows you to hit patrol bolts at considerable range to 4 kilometers. The high explosive TNT equivalent filling is 864.6 grams. That is enough to with one shell hit destroy a complete compartment of an enemy patrol boat and due to the high rate of fire and therefore the high shells hitting an enemy target you actually can do considerable damage to enemy destroyers as well. A few targets you cannot deal with including the Fletcher class, the Cowell and also the Sumner because they have armored belts around them that can deal with the 12 millimeters of penetration and as well of course light cruisers. But you still can disable mostly their guns and destroy the superstructure setting them on fire and so forth. The second shell type as a tier 2 upgrade is the 76mm DM261HE VT aka a proximity fuse HE shell. It is very good at shooting down aircraft because you can elevate the guns a lot, the turret rotation is great and the rate of fire also is very good. However, the lack of good visible tracer makes it not so great against a ship and therefore I would recommend the stock HE shell also because it has more penetration power and more TNT filling dealing more damage. So the high explosive proximity fuse shell clip also costs you 5000 silver lines per 80 round clip. That is quite expensive and you should also use this more in later game or in the late game scenario where there are significantly more aircraft in the air. Finally the torpedoes are the sealed DM2A1 torpedoes and you have two of them with a maximum speed in water of 61 km per hour, they are not the slowest but also not the fastest. Significant though is their range of 20 km per hour. The aiming distance is 90 meter, so that means they will only go active after 90 meters of distance 
and their warhead with 250 kilograms is also not the heaviest, but currently it is enough to deal even with a light cruiser. Now let's talk about the tactics. First off, how to use the ship properly, how to get the maximum out of it, and how to not get killed early on. And also at the end, how to fight against it, how to disable it, and how to deal with its amazing firepower. When you want to use the ship to its maximum, you want to avoid a direct firefight where the enemy shoots back at you. So you want others to take the damage for you. Something like the Russian MBKs, river patrol boats and anything with armor. Or that just simply can soak up the damage like the SF-40 Leichter for example. So you want to put yourself at a rather long range for patrol boat aspects. So let's say 2, 3, 4 kilometers and uh, you want to also focus down the enemy ships that can deal with you or that have significant firepower. So you want to focus on the rather big ships, you want to focus on LCS and some of the other ships equipped with um, bigger cannons or just simply being very dangerous. You have the damage output to do so and they also pose the greatest threat to you. You do not want to push into a cap and then stay there up until the point that the destroyers arrive. You want to avoid destroyers. Yes, you can initially push with your team if you feel uh, rather like it and uh, you want to play it risky and you then can deal with the enemy patrol boats, can capture the capture points, but then you should um, go outside the cap into cover and try to avoid, as I said, the destroyers. Then, later game, when there are more and more aircraft in the air, you want to also choose the proximity fuse belt. Remember, the reload takes 30 seconds, which is quite a significant time, and you have no backup weapons. You have no 20mm or 40mm to go back and shoot up a pesky little patrol boat that just comes around the corner. Also, you have to also take uh, care about the firing angles and also the acceleration of the ship, which actually needs a bit of getting used to. So, how then do you fight against the ship? As I said, the ship has no armor, so if you have big guns, 76mm and up, with armor piercing in particular, just try to hit under the turrets and try to set off the ammo racks. The Amorex are rather big targets, but if you have just a small little patrol boat, what can you do? You can try to take out the turrets, even with small caliber guns you can disable them and then either try to escape or just simply destroy the ship with a torpedo or you have enough firepower to deal with it. And then also if you catch it in a reload, there is nothing that this ship can do to you. The final verdict on this ship is that it is highly effective, very dangerous, in particular to patrol boats and if you catch off guard an enemy destroyer even to those. Just a handful of ships can actually withstand its firepower because it has no armor piercing. That means if an enemy goes bow in, you only can damage and actually destroy the front section but nothing more, which costs you a lot of ammunition and also makes you vulnerable to return fire. The ship with its current performance and overall firepower and what it can do to in particular patrol boats but also some of the early destroyers actually puts it into a class of ships that have no place to go with destroyers but also have no place or shouldn't have no place to spawn with patrol boats. So ships like the Albatross they have kind of no place. They are not good enough to fight proper destroyers head on but they are way way too good in their performance and um, gunfire power to actually let them fight with or against patrol boats. An intermediate spawn, the increase in battle rating, a constant decompression is mandatory to make those ships actually have a good place in War Thunder. Don't get me wrong, they are killable, they are destroyable, you can deal with them, but if a good player sits in one of those things, he just can st um, sit in the back, snipe planes, snipe patrol boats, get an insane amount of reward and actually never gets put to the test ruining the day for so many normal people and normal players that just want to grind their way through it. And I think this is damaging. I kind of see the difficulty trying to balance them, but ultimately they are currently in a spot where they have just it way too easy in my opinion. Now, what did I do now in this battle? Let's comment on this battle. 
As you can see, I actually stayed near my spawn. This is again a problem with the overall map design, but in terms of tactics, I didn't want to go into the fight. I didn't want to go into the fight with other patrol boats, or I could, especially early game, be attacked from numerous sides and lose my ship, because the repair costs are just under 20,000 silver lines, including then also the potential ammunition costs for the proximity fuse of 5,000 silver lines per clip. This thing is rather expensive to run. Yes, it's fun, but I don't think that it is a good trade to bleed silver lines for fun or for being dominant, and in this case, practically overpowered versus patrol boats. This is at least then my opinion. And I just wanted to secure here A. I wanted to actually prohibit enemy patrol boats to rush into our spawn zone. And um, yeah, when there is then the right time, one can choose to push in and then make the play for it. So this is now what I want to do. Furthermore, I also want to wait for planes. Even in a full up tier, even if light cruisers are in the game and spawning these days also with destroyers, which is quite the opposite of what I actually think is good for the game in terms of decompression and uh, fun for also the small ships. I think that staying back and being able to snipe planes and being more effective than even uh, a flag barge, if you know what I mean, this is your bread and butter and I think also the team profits from it. So this is, yeah, a matchmaker. This is a ship that has a high impact on the outcome of a game if you play it right, if you play it conservatively, if you try to stay alive. Not just only because of the reason of the repair costs, but in particular with the proximity fuses and how much or and how many aircraft that there are late game, I think this is very, very important. And such an aircraft can easily wreck a destroyer or two or even two cruisers. Think about think about the BTD and also with the insane speed where it can drop its torpedo. This is the countermeasure from ships. So I have no problems whatsoever shooting down planes and protecting my ships with it. But also I think to uh, have fun and to rack up the kills is a good thing to actually win the battle. Now as you can see with the points, um, my team horribly failed. I still got so many kills. I still did a lot for my team. But ultimately, I never dared to go into the cap. And this is one of the downsides, in my opinion, um, of such a ship. And as you can see now with the torpedoes, with the launches, that they actually launch backward. And um, that is just also as a final countermeasure to destroyers, not viable. And then ultimately I got destroyed by a Cowell. So now this gameplay is the last that I want to show you and it sums it all up in my opinion. You saw how I destroyed destroyers before, shooting down planes and also how I did uh, multiple attempts. Very often you get on this map. I'm going straight for the cap. And this is very important because the destroyers are to be expected there in just a minute. So that means I have one minute time, roughly, give or take, to make my play. I can launch the torpedoes. The torpedo launch indicator is still a good uh, indicator also where enemy ships go. This is how the torpedo launches. So they first uh, go back, then they turn around and go towards the direction in which you aimed them. I want to take hard cover here between uh, behind this rock here and uh, I also intend to smoke myself up. This is dangerous. Um, a lot of ships with 40 millimeters can deal significant damage to you and this is always something that you need to keep in mind. You have amazing firepower like also here the Jaguar but if you play it wrong or you come across the wrong enemy at the wrong time and you have no support because you're just running in one direction, leave your team behind, then there is also just so much that you can do. And again, when your guns are disabled or you're caught in the reload, 
that is not good but when you come across one enemy at a time when you can make the play like this then it actually pays off now let's see what we can do to this guy yeah that is actually a pretty quick end to them i actually miss aimed here i should have kept aiming at the bow not just for one several and then there is a z20 a kyle Galaster. he has no armor and there you could see with just a few hits i actually reduced his crew quite significantly with just a few hits coming around the island there are some enemies the one that has been beached that has beached himself is no threat he cannot depress the guns far enough and i actually am more interested into getting in, in getting into cover so the question is can i make it into b and what then because the destroyers go for c the destroyers are my absolute arch nemesis they can deal absurd amounts of damage to me they can wreck me easily and while i can deal a lot of damage to them as well i don't want to shoot them while they shoot me back it's not worth the trade but here you can see we can actually deal significant amounts of crew and then we actually get a kill on a Karl galster very nice that's already my ace now now i'm caught in the reload and oh god there is a light cruiser and i have just a few shells left in the background uh, in the back gun to keep checked how many rounds that are left in your magazine is very very mandatory so you then need to go into cover or need the support of your team while you reload there you could see i could deal a little bit of damage to the superstructure i captured the base and uh, now i'm kind of chilling here i'm kind of just observing I can shoot into A, shoot some of the patrol boats up, I can shoot here at some destroyers um, or you know fake destroyers like this type 1939 torpedo boat. You can see at which range I actually managed to engage him over three kilometers and it was a true knockout. The low rate of fire, the slow turret rotation speed on some of the uh, enemy destroyers, in particular the Germans and the Russians is something where you actually can abuse to just have the jump on them disable their guns and just kill them outright and uh, now i actually was then waiting for five minutes where I, there i was just chilling i wanted to stay out of the main fight i've already lost crew i'm slightly damaged and now the heavier units get in so i made a cut for five minutes and in the meantime i reloaded the proximity fuse belt and it is end game i successfully well protected here the capture points and uh, i think it pays off so early rush in versus the patrol boats trying to avoid the destroyers then also dealing with aircraft and always staying in cover never pick a fight that is equal because equal fights are for those who give the enemy a chance to get killed so and that is actually now the game where i survived and won um, this is a very good chip for a lineup by itself as well it has the firepower the gun handling and the rate of fire in general to deal with every opponent that it comes across and the few opponents that it can't deal with such as the Kowal because of the side armor and also some of the or all the light cruisers or some of the Russian armored river patrol boats try to avoid the fight now let's see how it has paid off to fight the way that I did 61,000 silver lines 7500 of them thanks to the survivor award and 7048 vehicle research points i think that's a good result that's it for this ship review let me know in the comment section if you enjoyed it let me know in the comment section what you want to see changed again the link to drakinifel's youtube channel is in the video description down below be sure to check him out and yeah thanks for watching thanks for listening please give this video a like if you did Subscribe if you want to see more and we'll see each other on the waves of War Thunder.